morning Patreon community. Today we are going to continue with the Spiritual Starter Kit and we're going to do Truth 3. Truth 3 on the spiritual path is linked to emotions and indirectly to breath as a solution. So, let me, so Truth 3, Truth of Emotions and Breath. So the universal law that we're gonna to discuss today is called the principle of correspondence. And most of you probably know it as as above, so below, as within, so without. I have to say that this is one of the laws that changed my life and makes it easy, if you will, to be on a spiritual path. Um, in the um, Kabbalion, in the um, intro pages, it speaks to this law and it talks about the veil of Isis. And Isis is a goddess in Egyptian mythology and is in many mythologies. There's always a veiled version of God or um, Moses couldn't see God's face in the burning bush when he got the commandments. Um, one of the religions that I grew up with was the Yoruba tradition and Yemaya Lokun lives at the bottom of the ocean and doesn't ever let you see her face. And we see this theme in mythology quite a bit. And it's this understanding that we don't have a right to see God and know God and know the why. And we have to be kind of comfortable in that in uncertainty. But this law allows us to remove that veil just a bit to understand what's happening in the higher planes. As humans, because of our density, we don't have permission, so to speak, to work in the highest planes of the universe. We only have access for the bottom four up into the Akashic plane. But this allows us to kind of know what's going on beyond and behind the scenes. And it gives me a lot of peace of mind. So basically what the law of correspondence says is whatever's happening in your external environment is happening in your internal environment. And whatever is happening so to speak, in your earthly realm or your dream world, your astral plane is also happening in the higher planes of the universe. So it is sort of like a sneak peek to the divine and it gives me a lot of peace. So we're gonna use this today in terms of our emotions and what our emotions are telling us about our inner states that perhaps we haven't had the logic or the reasoning to access, especially when we're in an emotional breakdown. So this is an image of Zeus and he is birthing Athena from his head. And this is Hephaestus who is helping him birth Athena. So the myth is such, Metis is a Titan. And at the beginning, there were two groups of main gods. There were the Titans that were then overruled by the Olympians. And the Olympians are those that we refer to on Mount Olympus, Zeus sort of being the ruler of Mount Olympus and having the biggest piece of the pie. So we know that Zeus was um, a philanderer and he was very promiscuous. And in one of his escapades, he got together with Metis, the Titan. So think of a Titan as sort of a brute, sort of animal rough around the edges type of person. And as is very well known in mythology, Zeus was told that he was going to be dethroned by one of his kids. So after he had relationship with Metis, he swallows her to avoid being dethroned. And it turns out that it's too late. Metis is already pregnant and um, is birthing Athena. As a result, since Zeus swallowed Metis, he indulged or engaged in parthogenesis, which is to birth the baby on its own. And he gets this splitting headache and he asks Hephaestus for help. And he's like, can you please crack open my head so that Athena can be born? So Athena here represents the principle of wisdom and knowledge and the use of, of rational thought. Um, and Zeus, I'll speak to about in a moment in terms of emotion and Hephaestus in terms of intuition. So Metis is the Titan, Zeus swallowed Metis, Athena is birthed from Zeus's head and Hephaestus cracked open Zeus's head. Now let me bring you to our brain structure. And just in very broad strokes, 
we have three brains. The reptilian brain is our instinctual brain. It's sort of like the old animal sort of titan brain. The limbic brain is our emotional system. And the neocortex is the most uh, recent brain. And it has to do with rational um, or our thinking brain. So in this story, Metis represents the titan brain, the reptilian brain. This part of our brain is activated when we're in instinct, when we are in a fight or flight response. Very often when we feel fear, the quintessential, you know, lion is chasing us, so to speak, and we engage in the fight or flight response. And I'm gonna tie this into emotion and breath momentarily. Zeus swallows Metis. This is extremely important because this is ruled by our limbic system and our emotions swallow us. Our emotions do not allow us to get into free will, do not get into rational thought, make good choices. And this is a vicious cycle between the fight or flight or the reptilian brain kicking off um, when we're in an emotional response of, of any sort. And Athena refers to the neocortex. She's birthed from Zeus's head. She's the goddess of wisdom. If we are able to stop the nonsense of the rep reptilian and limbic brain back and forth, then we actually can gain some reasoning and some thought and use some wisdom. However, the emotional um, circumstances, we lose reasoning and wisdom and we can't make good choices. Today, today is talking about why you have your preferred emotion, why you have your preferred coping style when an emotional response triggers you, if there's a physical response to it and why, and most importantly, the breathing aspect, which is to help you get out of the sort of um, reptilian and limbic um, brain, you know, sort of circular dynamic. Hephaestus, I kind of left out of this slide, but Hephaestus represents the intuition. Once you're able to get into free will, once you're able to breathe and bring yourself to the present moment, then you can check in with your guidance and see what's beyond and what the universe is telling you, which goes back to the law of correspondence. Why did I create this? And what is this demonstrating about my inner state? So this is a picture of the limbic system, the emotional response, the emotional brain. The limbic system activates the fight or flight response. So it works very closely with that reptilian brain. The fight or flight response is that quintessential stress response. The lion is chasing me, the bear is chasing me. What happens physically in the body is that anything that is unnecessary, what we call the rest and digest system, shuts down and we put all of the energy to the limbs because we have to run and we have to get away from the lion or if we're gonna fight it, we need enough energy to knock it out. So all of the energy is directed to the limbs. The limbs are ruled in astrology and mythology by Hermes. Hermes is panic, anxiety, the wing sandals, what keeps us going to the upper world and the lower world. And so again, it's this vicious cycle that I talked about last time of not being here now. And this is part of why we can't be present is due to these emotional responses that kick off the fight or flight response. This triggers a physical response to emotional experiences. There is in your body, no matter how subtle, a physical link to whatever emotional response you're feeling. In a moment, I'm gonna um, invite you to watch a clip that you can see an emotional response um, and a physical response linked. The amygdala over here, this little almond-shaped structure activates the adrenals to release cortisol. So this is like when we say that we have an adrenaline rush, the adrenals are right above the kidneys. Kidneys are directly related to fear. So fear is involved in this. It activates the adrenals, they release cortisol, and now you've started the fight or flight or stress response. And this is all related to your snow globe from zero to seven, that was shattered, your inner child got stuck at that moment, and that is what you respond to every time, no matter what the situation, 
from zero to 10. It could be the most insignificant thing, breaking your nail or the drama of your life. This is set off because it is a fear response. You'll see in a moment an abandonment response and it is your inner child got stuck. So if you followed me, you know that I have my snow globe theory. The snow globe is shattered from zero to seven does not matter the quality of your childhood. You came from a very dysfunctional home or you came from what you appear to be an intact home. Everybody's snow globe, no matter how dirty, is intact and snow globy in our psyche. What we experience in that snow globe, whether it's conflict, abuse, or pleasure, is the way that we assume that the world is. Those zero to seven years dictate the way we view the world and how everything is perceived in the world. This is our lens, and I'll speak to the moon sign in a moment. This lens, this snow globes get shattered at some point in your childhood. You're looked at in a certain way. You're told that isn't wanted here. Um, someone yells at you, screams at you, tells you that you're a loser, that you're fat, that you're ugly, that you're different. Some experience, conscious or subconscious, is stored in the subconscious mind and triggers the emotional response anytime you get close to feeling when the inner child got stuck. This is extremely important. So we all have four unmet needs. We were lied to, two major lies. The first lie is that we were supposed to be loved unconditionally. We were never supposed to be loved unconditionally and it's impossible for someone to love you unconditionally. It is your job, it's an inside job. It is about you meeting your own needs. Your parents were not supposed to, will never and can never meet your needs. And if you're a parent watching this, you do not love your children unconditionally and you cannot meet their needs. They're actually born to meet your needs. And it's a vicious cycle. We have children consciously, subconsciously to meet our needs. And so the child is always left seeking someone to meet his needs. And one of the reasons we get into relationship or addiction or work environments and such and such. Also, everybody has love needs over here because no one was loved unconditionally. However, there are other three needs that were not met. Most of us have one pressing unmet need. So for instance, for me, it's validation. So safety and security, protection needs and validation. And these are in direct relationship to the first three chakras. And everybody has all of them lacking, but there's one that kind of stands out. So in my family, it was academic achievement is success. That's how you get validated. So of course I kept learning and learning and acquiring degrees until I realized the nonsense. So find out what your one particular unmet need is and you can see that that is the need that you're getting, trying to get met by other people, whether it's with praise or a poor coping style or drama or attention seeking behaviors. And you must understand not only that your parents cannot love you unconditionally because they are flawed individuals and have not done this inner work so they can't love you fully, it is not your parents' job to meet your needs. It was your job to meet their needs. That is why you were born. So this is the amygdala, the structure I showed you earlier in the limbic system. And now we're gonna talk a little bit about the myths associated with the amygdala because they really respond to why we create emotional um, situations in our life. The amygdala is related to negative emotions and are linked to loss. It's an almond shaped structure right there in green and it activates the limbic system whenever it has perceived threat. Perceived is the important key here. That is linked to your snow globe shattering, whether you remember the story or not. That is linked to your world view of how you assumed the world was from zero to seven and when it got shattered. When you get close to dipping your toe into that getting anywhere close to you, you activate the fight or flight response, you activate your adrenals, your amygdala goes, everybody get into action, there is a threat. It can be indeed a lion, it could be traffic, or it can be like I said, your nail breaking. It does not matter 
the range of the situation. It is a perceived threat in your psyche that activates all of this linked to that snow globe shattering. So in Greek mythology, the amygdala actually means almond tree um, in, in Greek. And it's linked to loves that are lost and children that are lost, extremely important. Love is obviously how we attempt to get our needs met once we leave our, our childhood home. Our children, also another way that we get our needs met, but we also wanna stay in this idea that we are children so we can get our needs met. And if you've been following any of my teachings, you understand that we are a child of no one, we are not a child of the universe. We are the universe, and therefore it's our responsibility to meet our own needs. And like the law of correspondence says, the universe responds in kind at that vibrational level. So in myth, Nana is a water nymph. Um, she actually had an almond tree fall on her lap, and as a result became pregnant with Addis. She later abandoned him. This is how we feel. We all feel abandoned. If you're interested in learning more about the abandonment issues and the pituitary gland, I have a series on my YouTube of the 48 to 52, which is the master key and why we do this so that we can get whole and return home. Another myth is Phyllis. She's queen of Thrace and she actually committed suicide. Her lover went off to war and she was convinced that he was never coming back and the gods turned her into an almond tree because she was suffering greatly. So she felt abandoned by her lover. In my series of why we get married one and two, I discuss why we get into relationships and it's an attempt to get our needs met. And these two myths are directly related to why everything to do with family and love and relationships is always linked to negative emotion, loss and triggering the fight or flight response. So we actually have a problem in our country um, there's a name for it now. It's called alexithemia. It's actually a, I, I don't know if I should call it a disease or an illness, but it's a term that surfaced when they realized that we have very limited names for emotions. So um, there was a study done and they realized that most people can only name three emotions, sad, mad, and pissed. That's a very limited vocabulary. In my Seven Gates book, I share this emotional wheel to get people comfortable with naming their emotions. There's a great book called The Emotion Thesaurus that I highly recommend. It's a really good book um, with one emotion. It speaks to the facial expression, the emotional feelings, alternate words, synonyms, and it might really help you broaden. Because one of the things as adults, it's not that we don't feel and it's not that we don't have emotional triggers, is that we're able to own and name the emotion so that it doesn't take over. Another thing I use is something called the feelings and dealings card game. And it's really good. It's, it's intended for children. And if you do have children, I highly recommend that you sit and try to name emotions. It's something I did with my children early on when I left their father. Um, and it got them very comfortable with their emotions. Um, we need this as adults is to have an ability to identify the emotion that we're feeling at the moment so that it doesn't take over. So our negative core emotions are stuck. So these are obviously, you know, light and dark emotions. We're gonna focus for a moment here on sad, mad, and scared. These are the core emotions, peaceful, powerful, joyful, are the, the positive, if you will, but these are the ones that trigger us, okay? And then these are just other names, like in the emotion thesaurus that you can use. Every core emotion that is negative is where your inner child is stuck. It is related to an event at zero to seven or multiple events in which you did not get your needs met. At that moment, you identified that you were not part of the family, you were different, you were unworthy, you were unlovable. And what happens is you got stuck there. And every time an emotional response, some negative situation, it takes you to that moment. You may not be living that moment, obviously, in the world. You think it's your boss that fired you or your boyfriend that dumped you. It has nothing to do with your boss. It has nothing to do with your boyfriend. It has to go to zero to seven. Again, in my seven gates model, every single person, place, thing, or situation is mother or father, and this is related to that. 
Your hope is that by having this tantrum, this drama, this crying spell, choosing poor coping, that someone's going to rush in and save you, that someone's going to rush in and say, I'm so sorry, darling. We didn't mean that. You are absolutely loved exactly as you are and worthy. That's never going to happen. The moment passed. It's already a trigger. It's already recorded in your subconscious. And that's what you're reacting to continuously. So I'm going to give you an activity to see if you can try to bring up that emotional moment. You may already know it from the conscious mind, and that's great. But if not, this activity might help to trigger something. So I really encourage you to watch the whole movie, but a little clip. It's about two minutes. It's from Disney's The Kid. And you're going to see that in the movie, Bruce Willis and his inner child are in a scene and you, sh you see the snow globe shatter. You see when the father yells at the son out of fear in his own life, because that's the thing, your parents can't meet your needs because they're dealing with their own traumas and dramas. And um, he develops a twitch. And this is very important. At that moment, when that snow globe shattered and you identified that you were not worthy and lovable exactly as you are, you develop some sort of nervous twitch, maybe some GI distress, maybe anxiety. Again, the, the shaking of the extremities ruled by the fight or flight response, and you identified unsafe, and this is your physical trigger. It may be very subtle. It may be palpitations. It may be an anxiety attack. But for some people, it just might be diarrhea or as simple as a little twitch that is shown in the video. So I have a theory that is emotions versus feelings. Emotions are not fully processed feelings. So I'll give you an example. If you ever go to the grocery store around Thanksgiving, mothers are there with their children shopping, you know, probably very anxious for having a bunch of people over and have to cook for a bunch of people. And the child will have a temper tantrum. I want M&Ms, kick and scream. And the mother's probably so caught up in her own story and, and, and prepping and planning as she lets the kid have the tantrum and he's in the middle of the aisle or he's in the checkout screaming and kicking Snickers m and and the mother ignores him and lets him fully process that emotion and he's probably conked out at the end of it, falls asleep in the car chair on the ride home. That is a fully felt feeling. That is what we want. That is not what we do. Instead, we go to that trigger, we get stuck there, and our tendency is to seek a poor coping skill. I'll speak to that in a moment. This activates the stress response. This keeps you in child seeking someone to meet your needs. This could over time create long-term illness because that thought and that emotion again materializes and is sent into the body. And you'll see that in the, in the clip with Bruce Willis, but it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, undeal, uh, undealt with, unresolved, and it will be sent to a specific body part to hold that emotion. And what you do is you tend to find a poor coping skill to deal as a distraction with this feeling. And you don't fully feel it. That is not what we want. What we want is a feeling. We want to fully process it. So what we have to do is take the emotion and process it into a feeling, a fully felt feeling. This still activates the stress response. You're not off the hook. But once you fully feel it, you can process it and then you can stop the nonsense. This allows you to choose, this is the word, choose to go to teenager or adult or even choose to stay in child. Once you can get out of it, then you can make the decision, do I want to go into child and have the temper tantrum? try to ask someone to meet my needs, go into a poor coping, or do I want to use my free will to make a wise choice like Athena and even perhaps connect to Hephaestus, my gut, my intuition, and get a lesson law of correspondence from this. This does not cause illness because the entire feeling is fully felt and it eliminates from the body. The, the thought is materialized fully through. And the response is to sit with it feel it and completely breathe. And I'll talk to that in a moment. So one of the things that you can do when you're in this sort of fight or flight emotional response mode is to simply ask yourself, why did I create this? This question gets you out for a moment, out of the drama and child. 
you go into personal responsibility, you go into teenager or adult, and you take ownership that you're creating this. And you might want to continue it, that it's just a split second thought. Why did I create it? I know that it's related to a childhood wound. I know that what I want to do is confirm that I'm unlovable and unworthy. And then you can make a choice. If you stay stuck to your story, you're being stuck with your Costco membership. For those that are new to my teachings, we were given a very limited conditional love in childhood. I call this the Costco membership. We create these dramas and traumas and these responses in order to never leave that Costco card. This is also called the mass consciousness or the manger. Jesus was born in a manger, low vibration, low consciousness. If you choose to stay in the manger, if you choose to stay in that low level consciousness, then you're simply attached to your Costco membership. You're going to keep reliving this emotional response over and over, and that's your choice. However, if you go into teen or adult and you get out of the emotional response, and we'll speak to breath work in a moment, then you can make a choice to achieve Christ consciousness, what I call the Nordstrom's. I love Nordstrom's. I want to shop at Nordstrom's. So I get to make a choice to be the adult that I am and live my life accordingly and meet my own needs. All negative situations take us back to our abandonment fears. And you have your preferred emotion or your emotional response, crying, kicking, screaming, fear, grief, anxiety, panic, based on your story and what you created at the physical level. It's always linked to your story and it takes you there for every negative situation. Again, whether it's one or 10 in your life, every single one creates the same fight or flight response. Doesn't matter if it's minor traffic or a nail breaking or the drama of your life. So let's talk a moment about toxic water theory. Toxic water theory is a theory that I developed. It is linked to your moon sign. And we'll talk about that in a moment. And what we're trying to do is when we were sort of leaving the universal consciousness and we were put into the womb, all of our needs were met. However, they weren't met fully. They were met on our parents' terms, primarily mom. Whatever she was engaged in the external environment, again, as within, so without, you were experiencing in your internal environment. So what this created was a toxic water theory, a poor coping skill that you associate with mom, you associate with the symbiosis, you associate with getting your needs met, it's false. So if your moon is in Capricorn, for instance, Capricorn is a sign of ambition, hard work, duty. You might work very, very, very hard to get your validation needs met, all because you learned in your womb psyche, love is hard work, and your mom may have worked until her last day of pregnancy. If your moon is in Aries, for instance, which is a sign of conflict and aggressive behavior, perhaps you search conflict or you fight or you want aggressive behaviors to feel loved. This is an attempt to get back to the universal womb, this image here, the cosmos, but we don't know how to do that. So what we do is we're limited and we try to get back to the maternal womb, not the universal womb. But our desire is really to get in communion and union with the universe, but we don't know how. So we make that pit stop at the pregnancy, at the womb um, sort of psyche and that symbiosis and think that that is the way we're going to grow into adult and get all of our needs met. So in a moment, um, I'll talk to you about more about the moon, but um, it's basically the matrix or the perceived view that you gained in that snow globe. You actually got that during pregnancy and is the way you view the world. And every time you go into child, perceived threat, fight or flight, that instinctual sort of brain, that reptilian brain, what you're seeking is the womb and you're actually seeking your moon sign because that is what you determined was your definition of love. So my question to you and an invitation for you to work through this is, can you stop just for a split second before indulging in your toxic water theory, whether it's shopping, whether it's sex, whether it's food, alcohol, whatever it is, can you take a breath? Can you just stop and think, 
Now you have this knowledge. This is just me trying to get back into my mother's womb. Take a breath and see if you can redirect your action. This isn't transmutation. Transmutation is when you change your belief system. Transformation is when you change your behavior. But behavior change, transformation leads to transmutation once we start doing deeper spiritual work. So it gives you an opportunity to make a choice based on free will rather than child behaviors. So this is an astrology chart and here's the moon. It looks exactly that. This person's moon is in Libra. If you want more information about your particular moon sign, I do have a moon workshop and a moon workbook where you can really learn about your moon sign, um, how it's the matrix in which you basically view the entire world and your sign will directly relate to how you go to child and trigger that emotional response. So you're basically in every situation looking for mom and it's through that moon sign. This was learned in pregnancy. This is your definition of love. However, it is a shadow love language. It is not like the famous book, the love language is the positive. There is some correlation there, but it's not the positive. It gives us the problem, it's the negative. This keeps you in child. This is your default. You do not need to know astrology. I offer this for those that want to go a little further. This is indirectly related or directly related to your coping style. But if you wanna know deeper, you can Google the day of your birth and your moon sign and they're free online. Um, this is child consciousness. If you don't move past this, this is the default. This is how you show up in your relationships. This is what is ruining your romantic relationships. You're seeking your mother in your partner. You're seeking this form of love rather than Venus that I spoke about in the truth of desire, which is more of the romantic or the Eros love. What you're doing is you're seeking mom and your partner to meet your unmet needs. And again, I direct you to why we get married video one and two, part one and two from my YouTube series. And the truth is in the triangle workbook that's on my webpage also goes into depth. So I want you to engage in an activity. Just when you're calm, when you're not in an emotional response, take your go-to emotion. We all sort of have a go-to emotion. Mine is hopelessness. And write that on a piece of paper and crumple it up. And then I want you to pass it all over your body slowly and see where you feel it. And wherever you feel it, it might be your head, it might be your heart, it might be your arm, it doesn't matter. Try to expand on that comfortable, uncomfortable feeling or emotion and really try to feel it. And now try to close your eyes and connect to your intuition and see what earliest memory, don't judge it. If, you, if you're lucky enough to get to zero, zero to seven, great. If not, it was last week, fine. This is all a thread, building, 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 takes you to your moment of conception. So any story is valid. And try to go to the youngest memory you have of when you first experienced that emotion. And that's similar to what you saw in the clip of Disney's The Kid. And my question to you, my invitation is, can you hold it? I have learned that probably it passes within 20 minutes. Can you hold it? And with this activity, it might be easier to hold it and feel it fully because you're not in the emotional response. And that's why I invite you to do this. But see what happens. See, does it go away? See if it gets lighter and kind of journal what happens. So this brings me to breath. The emotion is working in, all of this is working in the autonomic nervous system. And there's two aspects. There's the sympathetic and there's the parasympathetic. The sympathetic is that fight or flight response. The bear is chasing me. I need to put all my energy to my extremities so I can run or confront it. The parasympathetic is what we call the rest and digest. This is why a lot of people have GI issues. You're constantly in a fight or flight response. There's no energy going to your digestion. And then you have stagnant digestion. And we know that that's one of the pillars of health. So if we're constantly in this fight or flight, it's affecting us on many levels. So we want to go into the parasympathetic nervous system, and it's the breath that gets us out of that emotional response. So this is one activity, and then I'm going to take you in a moment to another. 
So yogic breathing, yogic breathing, you can do this just for about 30 seconds. And I want to see what you glean from this about your psyche. This is an invitation to see your mentality. Do you have an abundance mentality or scarcity? So put your hand on your belly. And if you want, close your eyes. Take a very, very deep inhale where you feel like Santa Claus. Your belly is extended and distended out fully. Try to hold that for four breaths and then completely, completely exhale like your stomach is super, super flat. And if you don't get it the first time, then do it again. But I want you to identify which one you liked better. Did you feel more comfortable in the inhale when your belly was full? Or did you feel much more comfortable in the exhale when your belly was flattened? We have a scarcity and or an abundant mentality. And our physical responses to the emotion is going to dictate the potentiality of the illness that you get linked on this mentality. If you liked the inhale and you really enjoyed being full bodied breath with your Santa Claus belly, you're living from more of an abundant mentality. This is not that it's one's better or the other. The zero to hundred, it's the same coin. If you liked being flat stomached, then you prefer a, um, or you have more of a scarcity mentality. This relates to the wound at childhood. If you have an abundant, you have to be loud and scream and dramatic perhaps in order to get the attention that you needed at that moment to get your needs met. If you have a scarcity mentality, you cower, you shrink, you put yourself in a corner, maybe on a timeout so that no one sees that you're going through your hopelessness or your grief or your fear or your depression. So these are directly linked to that what becomes our mentality in terms of scarcity and abundance. And it's fascinating. So I have an abundant mentality and I created an abundant illness, which is cancer. Cancer is the cells grow, grow, grow. If you have a scarcity mentality, you can develop perhaps a osteoporosis, which is like the bones breaking down and you're actually in a breaking down scarcity mode. So the emotion is directly related to the sort of illness that you can possibly have. It's also directly linked to the way that you express the emotion. So I'm very dramatic, I would cry yell and scream, and that was the way to seek the attention. Obviously, in my story, I wasn't heard. My mother didn't you know, listen to me. I started talking loud, eating, loud and cursing and yelling. So I would seek that attention. And then it seeped into other areas of my life. As I balance this, and I don't let the emotional reactions dictate my life anymore, I no longer have to live in scarcity or abundance. I'm in that 48 to 52, I'm in that perfect sweet spot. And I have, I have both, we, we do have both. A lot of times people that do this activity, what I've noticed with my clients is if they like to have the, ex, the inhale, they enjoy taking up space. They may play small, but their psyche is actually, I wanna take up space. So they might add extra weight onto themselves. Whereas scarcity people that prefer the inhale where they want to sort of shrink will live small, small spaces and then perhaps have a direct relationship to food, for instance, or put on weight. You can see that's the same, same coin, just different side because they're scarce and they wanna protect that they're, they're cowering and, and small. So we can't automatically assume that because someone has, let's say, extra weight on them, that they have an abundant mentality. It could be scarce. Illness will much more tell what sort of mentality you have. This activity can really help you get to the root of that, and it might help you link back to your zero to seven emotion. Did you cower? Did you shrink? Did you yell and scream? Was your father beating up your mother and you had to hide behind a couch? You couldn't be seen, so someone didn't abuse you or hurt you. This is going to indicate and be related to this. So lastly is emotions and breath. So in the yogic path, it's called pranayama, and there's many forms of pranayama. Um, but basic breathing, just being very aware and conscious of your belly in and out, 
is a very simplistic way and will get you out of the sort of emotional trigger and the emotional response gets you out of sympathetic nervous system, the stress response, and gets you back into the parasympathetic, your rest and digest. So this is very important. We want to get to that point of calm. Now, why is this so important? If we stay in child, we are constantly not only going to affect ourselves in illness, but we're not going to be able to stop creating karma. We're not going to get into saying, thinking, and doing as an adult, showing up for ourselves, meeting our own needs, and transmuting our behavior and our consciousness to become spiritual adults. So these are all linked together. But you have to really identify your emotional response and the triggers um, prior to being able to consciously choose um, to breathe through a situation. Thank you very much. And I'll see you next week.